This is the Gambling Gauchos. Welcome into the Gambling Gauchos. I'm Rob Bro. He's Kyle Jacobson, live on site in the Cardinal Sports Center studio. Two at Rahino Barbecue. Talking to Aaron Rahino, owner, prov- provide, provide, purveyor, purveyor. How do you say that? Owner, cook, uh, chef. Did you mean proprietor? Did you mean proprietor? Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Either way, we're here with you. We always enjoy coming, Aaron. I guess how you doing today? That's how we usually open them up. Yeah, man, I'm doing good. It's uh, not too hot today, so uh, I'm enjoying it. Well, you've got a good setup out here with the patio and some games for kids, you know, while people eat their food and everything. Um, I tell our listeners, I'm sure they've maybe read a little bit about your story, but how y'all got started, how long y'all have been doing this, all that good stuff. Yeah, man. So we went to a trip in Houston to Houston, Texan, Houston, Texas to go see a Texan game uh, a, w- a few years ago. And we had our first experience with like a real barbecue place. We grew up eating barbecue uh, and cooking barbecue growing up, but we had never really been to like a true texas barbecue restaurant and so whenever we went to this place we were just blown away uh, kind of by how they cooked everything and and uh, we were like we got to do something like this in in a small town west texas so uh we uh we got back and i kind of started to practice on briskets and stuff like that and we had a lot of really bad briskets before they started to get good right um and uh but Even yeah the bad ones taste good yeah though, right? <laughs> i don't know these were pretty bad <laughs> these were pretty bad uh but yeah so we we went there we came back and we just started practicing and uh it just kind of took off from there we built a little facebook page and just kind of um did that for a little bit put out there we would cook briskets for your birthday party or your uh whatever and uh we would after about a year of doing that we set up in front of our house one day and said let's just cook some food and sell it in front of our house and we did that a couple of times and we had a pretty good turnout and it just kind of grew from there and this i guess started as a hobby did you always think it would turn into maybe your main gig and 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 that was the 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 future you saw even in the beginning you know that was always a hope to be able to do that but in the beginning it was more of like let's just do it for fun and then hey let's just try to make a little extra money doing it and and then it kind of got to the point where we were getting so busy I was having to call into work and stuff like that to take catering jobs and stuff like that. And I'd get denied my days off, so I would have to call in. And so it just kind of grew from there. But it was always a hope to be able to get there one day. Um, It just happened a lot quicker than what we thought it was going to. Well, you've had a lot of success um, out of the gates here as a business, you know, named to the top 50 barbecue joints in all of Texas by Texas Monthly. Uh, You're also named number one barbecue joint in the world by the Gambling Gauchos. Um, (laughs) You know, I'm sure those were both really incredible honors. But um, how has it been with both the local community feedback and to, to get some honors and recognition like that? Man, it's been a lot of fun. You know, when we first started, no one knew who we were. Uh, we, I grew up here in Olton, so everyone knew who I was here. But outside of Olton, no one knew who we were. So no one was traveling here to eat here. Um, and so we were relying on a lot of our local support, which was really good in the beginning. And uh, we've never had a true barbecue restaurant in Olton before. And so it was kind of a learning experience for all of us to just kind of go through that. But, uh, man, the local support has been really good uh olton is somewhat of a hub to a lot of smaller towns around us and so we do get a lot of people that come out from towns that are 10 to 15 minutes away from where we are Um, and we're kind of able to be something that you can bring your family to whenever they're in town or uh, you just want to show off to somebody or whatever have a lunch uh, meeting here or something like that Um, so it's been a lot of fun and just to hear people say hey i'm from over here i came from here i drove from here uh so it's, it's meant a lot to us to be able to to uh, have that experience the last time i was here is a little bit different um it was 29 degrees the <laughs> patio was shut down yeah you guys still cooking uh but even with the bad weather it was it was really bad outside uh, but a guy walks up while you and i were talking uh for the first time he says hey i'm from mule shoe i love this place uh, you said, oh, what you in town for? He's like, you. Yeah. So uh, it is It is a thing that people just come in. Um, and I, 
a lot of people look at successful businesses or, or places and they are like, ah, that was an overnight success. Mm-hmm. But I think what you've described is, you know, a lot of hard work to even get to where you are now. Uh, you mentioned earlier before we started recording, your brother uh, owns the place next door. I know you work with your family here. What's it like just being so close to family and kind of having a family business here that you're growing together? Yeah, it means a lot to us, you know, and I really think that if it wasn't for our family that was here, we wouldn't be where we are right now. They allowed us to, like I said, my brother opened this store in 2012. And at the time, this lot was empty. Uh, we didn't own it, but at the time it was empty. But we always kind of had an idea that if we were to do something, we could do it on this lot. And uh, so we were able to get that. And uh, But in the beginning, it was my wife and me, and that was it. Uh, and so in order to have some extra help, we, all of our family pitched in and uh, we told them, like, you can help us, but we don't have any money to give you. Um, and so everyone pitched in, man. And in the very beginning stages of, of our business, my brother would be able to help us out with a lot of business with people coming to his store and whatnot. Um, and so it's been huge for us to be able to be here and do this with our family. Um, and our, our family is just a huge part of what we do. I know recently, um, either earlier this month or maybe back in May, y'all launched a mobile food truck. So for the folks that maybe can't make it out to Olton very often, and it seems like so far y'all have served communities all across West Texas. I think I saw y'all were in Littlefield, Plainview, Lubbock. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that's going and, may, and maybe future plans for the food truck? Yeah, so uh, we did launch a mobile uh, unit for us to be able to kind of take our food to people. You know, I know that people are busy and it takes, you know, an hour maybe sometimes to get here. So we had the idea of trying to take our food to wherever they were um, and make it just a little easier uh, to try to get what we're doing. And uh, yeah, so we're doing all over, going all over West Texas, trying to just uh, weeks say spread the Reno barbecue gospel and uh just do that and then in the future we uh we definitely want to have a location either in lubbock or amarillo or maybe in plainview uh but while still operating the mobile unit to be able to go uh just spread the gospel is that like a brick and mortar gospel uh, joint there maybe in Lubbock or? Yeah, we're definitely looking into that. Uh, we've looked around in Plainview a lot and uh, it's just we get a tremendous amount of following from Lubbock, even being all the way out here. And so we uh, we definitely have eyes on on some things up there uh, and just we'll see what what works out first. Man, it, I mean, just put it on the I-27 corridor and you'll be having people all the time. Yeah. That'll be really nice. <laughs> Um, all right, football season coming up. Uh, maybe some tailgates or, or whatever else for the Rajeno family. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that we talked about whenever we got the mobile unit was to be able to uh, go to Lubbock and do some tailgating up there. Awesome. Um, and just kind of get game day uh, really popping up there. So well, hopefully it, would, it works out. It would definitely be popping with yeah. some Rajeno <laughs> barbecue. Uh, with those, uh, what are they, Texas Twinkies? Very good. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, I guess maybe tell the people where they can find you uh, if you're on social media or uh, I guess maybe some locations y'all are going with the mobile truck uh, in the near future. Yeah. So you can find us in Olton uh, every Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Uh, we open at 11 and we're here till about three or so. And then our mobile uh, trailer is always going to be kind of just all over the place. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter to kind of keep up with that schedule. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be trying to hit up to the north north and the south and east and west of this area so i'm sure you'll see us at some point you see him on the road go go see him tell him the gaucho sent you i don't know if there'll be a discount or anything but But it'll be a a free high five a free high five for sure for sure uh man i love that i love spreading the gospel um we're so appreciative what you've done for us uh, in this short time and We love spreading the gospel as well because we really do believe in what you're doing and the family atmosphere, the patio here in Olton. Uh, Yeah, sure, catch the truck. It's great food, but come out to Olton because it really is a fun experience. Uh, Aaron, thanks, man. Thanks for having us out. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. That was Aaron Rajino. Really enjoyed our trip out there. Uh, Kyle was a great navigator and passenger in the truck. Uh, Also chipped in for gas, so that was nice, Kyle. Uh, have you still been, have you finished your barbecue yet that you bought? I just finished. So you and I are recording on Sunday night. Yeah. And obviously we ate what Saturday afternoon. Yeah. 
we had lunch at Reno on Saturday, had some leftovers for dinner Saturday night. Did I say we're recording on Saturday night? No, Sunday night. Okay, yeah, it is Sunday night. Wasn't trying to fool anybody there. And then, yeah, we had it for dinner tonight, Sunday night. So, yeah, I made three meals out of it. Uh, Mrs. Gaucho had three meals. Fantastic stuff. Did you start the gauchita on uh, Virginia barbecue yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> She's close, though. I didn't know that Aaron was a John Mayer guy. If he's not, whoever runs the playlist is. I'm telling you, man, eating good barbecue with one of my best friends while John might while John Mayer plays in the background. Yeah. I, I was alive in that moment. You and Aaron pretty good friends? I think we're or me. Oh, we're me? Solid. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I met him a few times. Good guy. No, I'm just kidding. No, it was uh, it was a good time. I wish I would have got some big red after I left. That that's usually what I pair my barbecue with. Yeah. I, sometime off air, I'll tell you what uh, uh, Mr. Wiley said over at Wiley Barbecue one time when we were eating barbecue mm-hmm. about big red and how sweet it is. I'll say this as well: there are some people that I would call barbecue snobs, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Yeah, but they would be hesitant. Or just outright opposed to putting barbecue sauce on something like a smoked brisket or turkey. Right. I'm not that highbrow with my barbecue. And their sauce at Reno is really good. If that's something that matters to you. I don't think that's something that we've mentioned before. Obviously, all the food itself is good. But their barbecue sauce is really good, too. Yeah, I had uh, the baked potato. 10 out of 10 would recommend. And that is a potato. It's a large potato. I ate half of it with a big pile of brisket on top. Yeah. Anyways, great time. Obviously, uh, back still in the Cardinals Sports Center studio. MyCardinalsSports.com. Plano, Lubbock. The Lubbock Cardinals sidewalk sale July 7th and the following days. I think we still have plans to uh, go out there. See Bradley oh, yeah. and the boys. We'll be out there. All right, let's get into a few things, Kyle. Um, your lists have been going swimmingly. Um, F the Aggies. <laughs> I don't know if we're still trying to keep this family friendly. Uh, they, they, it seems like every single Aggie has a battery story. <laughs> I've, I've never like seen or yeah. heard a legit tale. There is a, a news story where, Lincoln Riley says something about batteries, but that was after he left and he's probably just perpetrating it as well. It was after he left and that clip or not clip, but that excerpt almost sounds like the interviewer sort of led him to say that. Yeah. Cause the way it reads is like, yeah, batteries as if it was, as if he was specifically asked about it and he probably should they have said like the questions. Yeah. He probably should have said, like, I played in Costa Tech. We don't throw batteries. But, yeah, it's hilarious that that's their go-to at A&M. And I called that guy out for it. I was like, you read that on a message board and just thought you could come here and get away with that lie. Yeah. But I don't know how many games at the Jones I've been to. I've not seen a battery thrown. And here's the other thing. Yes, you haven't played them in 10 years or whatever it's been. But even going back to the 60s, there's photographic evidence of – a&M's vandalism of the Will Rogers and Soap Sud statue. There are news articles that were written back then, even before smartphones in the early 2000s when this rivalry was still going strong. There's video clips of an A&M cadet shoveling literal crap at the UT band. There's news reports that Mike McKinney, the chief of staff to Rick Perry back at the time, was engaged in Aggie on Aggie violence and tried to blame it on tech. Right. Like, all these things I've got historical accounts, newspapers, photographs, videos, and they've not given us any of that, not an ounce. And so, like, if this happens all the time, if every time there's an AM versus tech football game, y'all are getting pelted with batteries, how has there not been a single news report, police report, photo, video the whole time? I don't get it. Yeah, I really don't either. And the one the one guy today or or yesterday I, I just saw it today but uh he responded to you and was like oh man yeah you're saying the modern era but if you just take it from the 60s tech's only ahead by one still it's like what are you trying to prove dude like, what are you trying <laughs> okay. to prove like you 
you literally just and then he was like, and if you if you only take it from when we were in a all male school, text only ahead by seven. So it's like what do you do? Like, how does that make you feel better? I know. What are you doing, you stupid idiot? <laughs> I know, like so okay, I picked all right. Here, here's the situation, Rob. College football history goes back a long time. Yes. To the eighteen eighties or nineties when Rutgers first played Princeton. Yes. But since then, a lot has changed, which is why, despite the fact that Princeton has like 27 national titles, they're not considered a blue blood in the sport. There are multiple ways that you can measure, quote unquote, modern era. Post-World War II is probably the longest modern era. Um, you could do post-integration. The problem with that is different schools and different conferences integrated at different times. And so that's kind of hard to pinpoint. And the other uh, marker that I chose on the modern timeline, whatever you want to classify that as, I think this is fair. Once Texas Tech was in the same conference as A&M, because before you were, when you were in the border conference, that was the equivalent of what we call group of five now. Right. And so it's kind of like TCU. Counting their time in the Mountain West versus their time in the Big 12 is not exactly a great comparison. Right. So I said, look, if you want to count after World War II, Texas Tech is leading the series, a close series by one game. Or if you want to count after the time they were in the same conference, which would have been close to integration, it's also a pretty even series, but Texas Tech has a one-game lead. And for some reason, his counterpoint to that was, well, if you go from this, Tech is only leading him by seven games. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I was being more charitable than you yes. were. I didn't – He okay. made it worse. That guy made it worse. Like, what? And then he was trying to say, you're wrong. Hey, why are you cherry-picking these stats, man? Tech's way <laughs> further ahead. <laughs> If I wanted to cherry pick, <laughs> I would have picked the most generous timeline for Texas Tech, but I didn't do that. Yeah. I, I had picked World War II and I picked Southwest Conference and beyond, an, an 80 year window and a 60 year window. Like you could if have I wanted, just picked Big 12. I could have done that too. And Texas Tech also leads that series. Yes. The only way, the only way you can slice it to give AM the advantage in the all time series is if you count the first, what was it, six games of the series where you played in Amarillo once. And other than that, it was in College Station or San Antonio. And it was in the 1930s and 40s before Texas Tech was even close. Texas Tech has never been on a level playing field with a ter in terms of resources and everything. But if you counted Southwest Conference and beyond, you could say at least they're in the same conference and they get sort of the same notoriety within the, within the state of Texas. Right. That's the only way you can give AM the series lead. If you say, well, back in the Great Depression, before any black players were allowed to play, <laughs> and when Tech was in a minuscule conference, yeah. then AM has the all time series lead. Other than that, Texas Tech leads it. And it's still close. Like, just given those six games, it's still close. It's a great rivalry. It is. And I wish, I wish you could go back and, and ha like, fix whatever happened with Texas and Oklahoma and AM in that area. And Missouri and still have the Big 12 and yeah, like go back to when they signed in the Longhorn Network and say this is going to blow up the conference and you're just all going to be in the SEC in 10 years. And maybe right. that was the long con, but yeah, because hey, it's not Texas, you can have an extra $10 million, but we're going to make a Big 12 network because it's better yeah. for the conference. And it's not just about Tech and AM. That is a great rivalry. Like it's an underrated one because it's not AM's primary rivalry. They're more concerned with UT. Right. But you lost UTA and M for a decade. You lost OU Nebraska for a decade. You lost Colorado, Nebraska. Like I thought those were great games. Mizzou, Kansas, great rivalries. And yeah, the yeah if you War. give me the original Big 12, I'd take that seven days a week. It's kind of sucked to see it step by step lose a little bit every few years during the realignment stuff. And, and I think you're going to develop something with Houston. I think that's a really natural fit. Um, but it's going to take time. And if conferences keep changing, uh, and again, I don't think BYU is going to, they're going to come in and help the conference, but they're, they're going to be like West Virginia. They're always going to feel like an outsider. Um, it's really taking time for TCU to feel like they're a part of the conference and not just the new guy. Yeah. And I think West Virginia has done a good job of maintaining. They haven't played Pitt, which is their big rival, but they have played Maryland, Virginia tech, which they consider their old rivalries from the Big East days. They played Pitt a few times. Have they since going to the Did Big they, 12? They play them this year? 
They play them this year. I think that's the first time since the realignment. Though. They didn't play them last year, though? That's what I'm saying. I don't think so. Hmm. I could be wrong on that, but I don't think they've played Maybe they yet. played them in basketball or something. Yeah. I hope that BYU still plays Utah because that's their big rival. Yes. Because um, I think there are schools that make that work. Like I said, uh, I think West Virginia's done a pretty good job of that. They haven't gotten to play Pitt. But if you ask Georgia Tech, they play in the ACC every year, but their biggest game is a non-conference game against Georgia. Right. So – it's it's doable. I wish that the conferences were better aligned for those natural historic rivalries, but it's just not the world we live in, unfortunately. Right. Uh, West Virginia leads the all-time series. Yeah, they didn't play since 2011. Wow. Yeah. But they do play this year. That'll be a 61 great conference game. And f- to 40. So, yeah, I... Um, I think that's the only tweet in our entire 100 plus day countdown to kickoff that has anything to do with A&M. <laughs> and I was honestly surprised there weren't more people just because A&M Twitter is like an absolute force. You know, they win yeah. every poll, every fan poll. Like, what's the best college town in Texas? College Station is going to win every time because A&M Twitter is just crazy. <laughs> and so any other time I've tweeted something like that about A&M, it gets posted on Tex Ags or wherever and just a horde of them come after you. Right. There's only a handful and maybe – like some folks speculated in the discord, they were just so owned. There was no response to that thread. What are you supposed to say? I don't know. I guess you just accuse me of cherry picking everything in the last 80 years, but that's not really what cherry picking means. And they were like, Oh, well, you know, tech fans punched my mom. Okay, sure. I totally believe that happened because every accusation you have is hearsay. And I've given you newspaper articles, photos and videos, and you've got nothing. So, so I just call them liars. I don't even entertain it. I say, no, you're lying. I'm very confident that you're lying to me. All right, you also tweeted a lot about uh, uniforms. You asked the people what their most underrated Texas Tech uniform was, and a lot of people just tweeted their favorites, which yes. there is a difference. <laughs> yeah, so a difference. Underrated, what I was saying, it was kind of like, a uniform that nobody is like, oh, yeah, we're wearing these. Yeah. The thing is on the throwbacks, which is what a lot of people. The Zach really- Thomas throwbacks, man. It's like everybody loves those. That's everybody loves those. That's properly rated. Yeah. If we wear those, everybody goes nuts in a good yeah. way. And so, yeah, yeah it's, they get the respect they deserve. I was going for like under the radar stuff you don't wear that often that nobody really talks about. Yeah. Or that you wear a lot and nobody respects, like the black, white, black. Yeah. No, that's a, you- a common away uniform, but it's a great look. What do you feel about paring down? Because right now you're like boring Oregon. Oregon. If you're Texas Tech, she has so many combos, but it's just the, it's the same red helmet. It's the same red jersey. It's the same black pants, white pants, red pants. And then you just wear a different combo every week. It's the same uniform. What do you feel about just wearing black helmets? And then black, white, black. Black, red, black, or black, red, white at home with a uh, blackout in October or November, whenever, whenever it is late in the season at night, and the throwback of choice. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine to pare it down. I, so I grew up as a tech fan watching during an era where they wore the exact same all black helmet every game. There was yes. no red face mask. There was no stripe on it. It was a solid black helmet for yes. more than a decade, if I recall correctly. Until freaking Tommy Tuberville brought yeah. his stupid Auburn white helmet with the double black lines. It's like, we're not Auburn, Tommy. Yeah. So I am totally fine to live in a world where you wear one helmet, a black helmet. I have yes. never liked the red helmets. Bring back the bass boat. The red helmets don't match. It, it, just don't, it doesn't look good with the red double T. No, it, it looks bad. If you had a black double T, uh, I could maybe learn to like that more. I, I guess the one exception. Ooh, I like a have, black throwback double maybe. T? Maybe, yeah. The flat black double T? Yeah, I think that'd be a good look to try out at least. But if it's like candy red and not this like dark uh, chrome red, that's yeah. what I don't like. I don't like, like the dark pearly. chrome red. Yeah, I don't like the pearly red. The only exception I would make potentially to wearing a black helmet every single game is the white throwback helmet. Yes. If you wore that once or twice a year, I'm cool with that. And then if you you wore a black helmet 10 games a year, white helmet twice a year, give me that. 
I also don't need red pants in any combo. No. I think you could go black pants for a blackout, black pants on the road. If you want to do the gray ones for the throwback look, fine with that. But pretty much I'd be fine with two colors of pants. I'd be cool with silver pants as opposed to the new Under Armour gray, but I guess Under Armour only can do yeah. gray. I'm fine with either gray or silver. I'm not picky there. Um, yeah. One exception, I do also like the, this is probably an 05 to 07 or 08 era look when you did red tops and red pants at home with a black helmet. The black, red, red. I think that's a sharp look. So I, I guess maybe you don't totally get rid of the red pants, but, but yes, to answer your question, and this is not what the, well, we're the red Raiders crowd likes to hear. You can do a lot of good with just a black helmet, black and white pants, and then alternating your top color. The double T is red. The yeah. numbers are red. Your letters are there's red. A, there's a damn red stripe on the pants. There's red in the jersey, yeah. in the uniform. We don't need a red uniform to be the Red Raiders. It's in the name. You don't need it in the jersey. Right. So that's know. my thought on it. Um, I, a look that I really miss, again, from like when I was a kid watching – the red Raiders was the black, white, white on the road. I felt like that was yes. really common in the Kingsbury Welker type era. Yes. And I think you've only worn that once in the last 10 or 15 years. And it was at Arizona during the Matt Wells era. I, I love the black, white, black, but you know what? black, white, white. I think that's a good look too. If the home look was black, red, red. And the road look was black, white, white. Then you went blackout a game and a throwback game call it a day i'm cool i'm well, good and you so this is an interesting this makes me feel old just in terms of how time goes by but when we first busted out a quote unquote throwback uniform it was in 2014 arkansas and it was paying homage to an era 19 to 20 years prior right <laughs> well 2014 was 8 years ago and now yeah. you're at the point where 22 yes. years ago, you have Give that, it to me. that Aztec trim. Give it to me. The year 2000. Yeah. It's and it's crazy. Years. Yeah. It's crazy that we would call that a throwback, but it's been long enough. And the bass boat would be a throwback too. Oh, yeah. That's what I wanted last year. I want the goofy numbers. Yeah. Now, it would be really funny if Under Armour just like put a little head on their logo. Oh, yeah. Because then it would kind of look like the big time logo. But yeah, the Aztec collar, the red jerseys with like the little balls at the end of the six or whatever. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, I saw an article. Are you done with the jersey talk? Oh, uh, we can be. I could also probably I go on ask, forever. <laughs> well, I love the bass boat helmet too with that look. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the bass boat look. Me too. But I saw an article headline that I wanted to ask you if you've seen anything on. Okay. Uh, and if not, I'm going to go try to find that article live, and it's going to be bad podcasting for a second. Okay. Did you see the Texas Tech uh, Joey McGuire wants to make the number three a coveted Red Raiders jersey like LSU does the number seven? I did not. Is that a take three thing? Is that is that because yeah, of Rodney Blackshear? Well, I think it's tech, a take three thing. I think the defense, uh, the best defensive player is going to wear number three. That'd be fitting in a way because two of your best defensive players in the last 20 years, Jamar Wall and Dwayne Slade, both wore number three. Yeah. I think, did Doug Coleman wear number three for his season? Yes, I think so. He had this seven INTs. Your season? Yeah, yeah, he had seven INTs wearing number three. So this is from Don Williams. Oh, it's also uh, Luke Siegel thing, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, sophomore cornerback, this is Don Williams from the AJ. Love it, KJ. Don Williams, decorated. Wonderful. Uh, sophomore quarterback Kobe Miner has the number three jersey of the Texas Tech football team, but he now has competition from 100 other players to keep it. Number three was the jersey preferred by Luke Siegel, and Joey McGuire plans to make it an award for players who exhibit the fighting spirit displayed by the late son of former Tech tennis coach Tim Siegel. Here's Joey McGuire's quote. That guy will come in in the fall wearing the number three and will be the toughest, hardest working, most competitive guy on the team. If it ends up being an offensive lineman, we'll just put a three on his helmet as a helmet sticker. Or he could be 93. 73, 63. Yeah, offensive lineman. It would have to be 53, 73, or 63. Oh, yeah, not 90. That'd be a defensive uh, lineman. Yeah. 
So that's pretty cool. Fight like Luke, number yeah. three. I hadn't seen that. So who would you give number three to this season? Um, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not there at practice, but toughest. Um, Hardest working, most competitive. Yeah, most competitive. Yeah, I don't know. I'll give you. I mean, it could be. Uh, I'll give you two names. If you're wearing it, it could be anybody on defense, I believe, with the new rules. Uh, about, and then anybody but offensive line, really, on offense. How about Tosh Brooks on offense? Yeah. Miles Price? Yeah. He was really active um, on the – did we talk about the – did we talk about the brand? I'd put Rabbit. On defense, number three. Yes. Well, I was about to. That's what I was getting to. Did we talk about that finale on this show? I haven't. I need to catch up. Okay. So that must have been on the Raider line kick game, 11 to 1 weekdays. Uh, I was disappointed in the finale. I'm sorry spoiler, to hear that, Rob. Spoiler alert. The first three episodes, about 20 full minutes. And then you had like team, offense, defense for the first three episodes. The final episode. Uh, I was supposed to incorporate the spring game. Do you want some conspiracy through here? Okay. The spring game underwhelmed, and they couldn't get 20 minutes out of it. So it was a nine-minute finale, and a minute and a half of it was the open and close was the same cut. And then the, the last minute and a half was uh, a press conference answer. Interesting. The spring game was weird. Because Donovan Smith, who should be competing for a starting a starting quarterback position, yeah, threw one pass. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, and he didn't look good in pregame. It was weird. I wonder if he was hurt. That's possible. And Tyler Shuck threw it right into the dude's face on the goal line, on a play action. Got it picked off. Barnett, Howard, and Williams is a law firm that was started by three Texas Tech grads. Do you like that transition? Was that just a perfect segue? I don't know that we segued, but it was a transition. <laughs> they, they call that of- a hard cut in the movie business. That's all right. <laughs> they office out of Fort Worth, but they have cases all across the state of Texas. One of the only law firms in the state that is certified for Title IX student representation. They've defended students, including scholarship athletes, in Title IX litigation at all of the major universities in Texas. They also handle catastrophic injury cases. Thank goodness, if Donovan Smith was hurt, it wasn't a catastrophic injury. Across the state, and for listeners in the Fort Worth area, they handle criminal defense and family law matters. Of course, they hope that you never need their services, but they are ready to serve in your corner if you do. You can learn more about the Barnett, Howard, and Williams Law Firm by visiting their website, bhwlawfirm.com. If you've been intercepted in front of thousands of fans, <laughs> Barnett Howard Williams. That was better. Yeah. You know who, circling back to the uniform discussion, <laughs> yeah. you know who did not like the All Blacks when Mike Leach first rolled those out in the early 2000s? Um, was it a player? It was a player. Cliff? I don't know about Cliff. Cole Roberts? Cole Roberts. He mentioned something to me one time about just not liking the All Blacks. Well, when they – so in in the Spike era, it was black, red, black? I think so. And then they didn't wear red for a long time. And then yeah. toward the end of the – toward the end of the Leech era, they were wearing black, red, red. Or maybe Nike brought that back when they were Nike in the middle. Right. Because I know – uh, so Cliff did not wear red under Leach. He's wearing red in that iconic first start against OU in 99. Right. But then 2000, 2001, 2002, you did not wear red at all. Yep. Nope. But BJ wore red, Cumbie wore red, Hodges wore red, and you've worn red ever since then. Um, except under Cliff, you didn't wear red in 13 and 14. And then you brought it back for TCU. Yeah. They, if you recall, they actually warmed up in – black jerseys i do went back to the locker room and changed and came out in red i do recall and that was black red red right black red black Black. red black 
I can't remember what year it was. I think it was in the seventies, but the Red Raiders pulled the same maneuver where they warmed yeah. up in one color and then came out in another against Houston. Was that what it was? Number five, Houston, I believe. Was that in seventy six when you were like playing them at the very end of the year? Mm. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe they I weren't ranked number five. I wasn't around season. then. I can't remember. Yeah, me neither. I can't remember. I wasn't there. Was... Um. Anyway, that's the last thing I have on the uniform talk. Okay. So, it, if Tech only wore one helmet, it would be solid black, no stripes, black face mask, old school double T on the side would be my preference. Okay. Or since they're not going to do that, just the 3D double T. Yeah, with the bass boat. All so you, you want the bass boat sparkle? Yeah, I liked it. All right, and then we're going... If you could just pick a black uniform, or, or are you saying black, red, red? Would be your go-to home uniform? So you want me to pick a base home and a base away? Yes, for you yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going for. Okay, base home... I would say black, black, gray, or silver, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I'm base, cool with gray pants. I don't like gray uniforms. Base away uniform. So black. you you would you'd be in with a mo- sorry you would be in with a modernized, um, like that first Under Armour throwback they did a modernized jersey like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll make Stripes. my answer. I'll make my answer really simple. The 1990s throwbacks should be your base uniforms. Okay. And then alternate is the 70s white, red, white throwbacks. And then do a blackout if there's a night game. And that's that's it. Call it good. And then on the road? Black, white, black, or black, white, white. I'm in. And I'm, I don't like the tech, the guns up stripe. Nope. Get rid of it. Uh, but I would like stripes on the sleeves, like the throwbacks. Yo, I mean, r- even the the because the white one looked good uh, when you played them um, when you played Arkansas the uh-huh. year after. Yep, because you wore those in in Austin too. Yep, I think that should be your base away uniform. I think the Gabe Rivera early '80s, the picture we tweeted out today for 69 days till kickoff, is a good yes. look. It's just a solid red with the stripes on the sleeve. Just do that. Did we get a Daggy shout out today yet? No, he's he wore number seven, Rob. No, I know, but he finished with sixty nine touchdowns and sixty nine percent completion rate. I think you got to do it today. Do you want to talk about your quarterbacks list at all? I mean, uh, yeah. I, there's uh, people were arguing that Patrick should have been first. A few people, no. I love Patrick Mahomes. He's the, great because of what he's done in Kansas City. I think the main spots where you got pushed back. And correct me if I'm wrong. Was Hodges, yes, Potts, and yeah. yes, and Daigie. yes. I guess generally speaking, a couple of people thought Potts should be higher, Hodges should be higher, or not on the list. And Potts Daigie was very divisive, lower. just like he was in his regular uh, career. Yeah. And if you read, actually, I don't think I put this in there. I was going to put in the write up that Sticks was just like Potts slash Sticks. Yeah. But Sticks had like 150 pass attempts. You can't be on that list with six career starts, I don't think. No, and less than 200 pass attempts, which is like three games for some of the air raid guys. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> uh, BJ is my favorite quarterback of all time just because of my age and what I was doing and where I was really coming into my football mind. Uh, Cliff, obviously my first favorite quarterback, but size like Zebby Lethridge, but as far as this list goes, um, so obviously those guys are going to get a little preferential treatment. Cliff also had three seasons, which you just stack up a bunch of stats when you're doing three full seasons. Yeah. He also had some big wins. Patrick did not have a big win. His biggest win, and that's not his fault. Bad defense. His biggest win was against Texas and Austin when they were four and seven. Or whatever they were, four and eight, five and seven, whatever they finished as. Yeah. So, like, love Patrick Mahomes. If you're just going straight arm talent, him and BJ, probably one and two. Right. Um, 
Graham, had probably a little bit of an underrated arm, but fit the system perfectly. He also had, like, if you just look at individual seasons, the best individual season by a Texas Tech quarterback was 2007, Graham Harrell. Mm-hmm. Just completion percentage, attempts, uh, yards, touchdowns, like, that was the peak. I think BJ was a victim of that Ole Miss game in Oxford not being televised. Yeah. And or not being in Lubbock. Like the fact that a bunch of Red Raiders didn't see that game because that was a huge win for yes. his individual legacy and for that team. I think he was also a victim of playing Navy in a bad bowl game. You know, they won, but like had you played. Right. Like, like had so- you played Cal. Yeah, so Cumbie lost to New Mexico in the regular season. And we don't talk at all about that regular season because they beat number four ranked Cal in the Holiday Bowl. People were chanting a la Caleb Williams, Spencer Rattler to get Cumbie off the field when they were playing mm, TCU, maybe early. And then they put up 70 on him, and everyone's like, okay, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> but like, Cumbie started out rough. Um, and just had the one season, but the reason I rank Cumbie probably ahead of Hodges, which flip a coin, Cumbie won his bowl game. And I think that while quarterbacks shouldn't get dinged on wins and losses, like I put, I still put Patrick number three or four, whatever it was, you do get a bump for wins and losses because the quarterback is a big part of your record. Um, obviously, Hodges is what it is. I love Cody Hodges. And being the seventh best quarterback since 2000 at Texas Tech is still really damn good. I mean, there's a bunch of good quarterbacks that have come through. Mm-hmm. There was some pushback on Shimanek. I got in the DMs from a certain Oklahoma favorite uh, where he did not appreciate that Nick Shimanek was on the list. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, if Tyler Shuck. Threw for 4,000 yards, 39 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions this year. And they went 6-6 six and six and got to a bowl game. I would not bat an eye. Mm-hmm. Even if he threw a 28-yard fade from the four and had a pick six against Kansas State that ruins the game. I do not care. If you go 6-6 six and six and he has 4,000 yards and 39 touchdowns, I am thinking, dear God, we've struck gold with Zach Kitley. I'm glad he's back. He's the next Cliff. You're going to have the number five offense in the country next year. If Tyler Shuck can do that, guess what the next guy can do? That's what I would say if, if you get there and, and that's what happens. That team was really close to winning nine games. Yes, they were. And that, and that uh, Cliff, hot take. I wish Cliff got fired in 2017. And they hired Dave Aranda. I'm glad that didn't happen. Because you've you've walked through the desert to get to Joey McGuire, but and maybe Dave Aranda wasn't ready four years ago and he needed a little more time to bake. But I wish you would have made that call. Yeah, I think Dave Aranda was waiting for a specific type of job based on how long he was regarded as one of the best three coordinators in the country. Right at Wisconsin and LSU. I thought Baylor was a weird fit for him, but I guess he loves it there and he's got it rolling. It looks like so. Okay, we got a question in the Discord chat. Okay. Hey, if somebody wanted to get in the Discord, Kyle, how would they do that? They would become a Parlay Picador on Patreon, which is $5 a month. Gets you access to the Discord server, early access to all of our public episodes like this one, and also exclusive access to our private episodes that we've conducted with Fardaz Amak, Cody Campbell, former letterman Will Culpepper, and Matt Mooney was our most recent one. This is a great interview. So five bucks a month, very doable. Patreon.com slash gambling gauchos. You can also find the link on our Twitter. And portion of all proceeds go to the Matador Club. So July 1st is coming up. We'll cut a check to the Matador Club. And you can put a um, like a little banner on your Twitter profile picture that says, I support the Matador Club if you join the Patreon. Anyways, we got a question. If you had a magic wand and could add one player like one current prospect to only one of our Texas Tech sports, so football, basketball, baseball, 
which team would you want that prospect to go to and which prospect are you taking? An uncommitted prospect? Uh, sure. Is that, I mean, is that the question? That's not specified in the question, but that's how I'll position it to you. Do you have an answer? Yes. You go first. TJ Shanahan? I need to read the question. Okay. Five-star in some polls, offensive lineman? Five-star offensive lineman, offer from everybody in the country. His brother, Michael Shanahan, is currently on the roster. He transferred in from an FCS school. I don't know how realistic of a shot you have with Shanahan. I think having his brother helps. I think he'd have no shot if he didn't have Joey McGuire. But clearly you need help in the trenches, so he fits that. It would make a lot of noise sort of on the national recruiting scene that Tech landed a five-star prospect. Yeah, and his official visits are Georgia, A&M, and maybe LSU next? Mm -hmm. Is he going to official visit Texas Tech? I don't know. Sure would be cool. Be a lot cooler if he did. Be a lot cooler if he did. And, you know, it's one thing for Tech. uh, Don't get me wrong. This would still be really cool. It'd be one thing for Tech to land a five-star quarterback or receiver, but those two positions sort of already fit what your identity is. If you were to land a five-star offensive lineman or linebacker, I feel like that would turn even more heads. And so basketball, you're kind of set for this year, so it's hard for me to – I haven't looked ahead at any 2023 kids yet for next year's basketball squad, so I'm sticking with the football and choosing TJ Shanahan. Can we say Drew Steffi, but he just comes here early? <laughs> Even though I don't know that you need him. Just he, his he's already shooting, committed. Man. His shooting. I know, but you would uh, reclassify him and he'd get here with Elijah Fisher. Yeah. Yeah, I like that answer. I like the TJ Shannon answer. Um, I There's a couple you missed out on that I wish you would have gotten. Avion Carter from Tascosa. Mm-hmm is when I wish I could wave a wand and he flipped to Texas Tech. Um, And then obviously some of the offensive linemen were defensive linemen that you were kind of rumored to get when Tim DeRuder came from Oregon. I think there was a five-star offensive lineman that kind of sniffed around for a second and then I think probably committed to Texas, if I'm right. Uh, But I really do like the... The TJ Shanahan, I, I think your reasoning is solid in that Texas Tech has had some four-star receivers and DBs and whatever else jump into the group here at Texas Tech, but those trenches, the, the four-star defensive end, uh, Vasek is one that may or may not be committing just to go an official visit. Uh, those are the ones that are like, oh, okay, wait, Texas Tech is like, actually recruiting and not just putting 25 guys in the class to make it look like they're number three in the country, which is what I've heard a lot so far. So a trench player, whatever it is, four yeah. four to five star. I'm with you on that. Of course, any five star would be electric because you don't have a five star player ever. In sure. Football. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Speaking of football, you and I have been to a couple Lubbock Matadors games since the last time we talked. And they are, of course, also one of our beloved sponsors of the Gambling Gauchos. Last night's game got a little bit feisty. It did. It was awesome, though. First off, that referee was terrible. Yes, he was. And I'm not just bitching and moaning about that there is a consequence to an official or a referee just losing control of the game yes and that's what it was like dude we're not just yelling at you because that was a bad call or bad no call you're losing control of the game and that results in players fighting each other and the benches going nuts and all that and uh, there was a red card and i love so the mozos started the little the fan group which i believe we're going to talk to next week yes Uh, but the fan group started behind the Matador's bench early in the season. Mm -hmm. And then they had a late rally where they were like, wait, maybe we should sit behind the opposing bench. Absolutely, And it has been a game changer. I think what was a great atmosphere is an even better atmosphere. Now that the coach can't talk to his players 
from two feet away. He has to get in their face on the bench, which does not happen anywhere else in the NPSL, at least in the Lone Star Conference. So excited about Lubbock Matador soccer. I've been to three or four games now. Each one has been electric. Even the loss in week one when I went, um, not as fun <laughs> as you lose. But that last night, one-to-one draw, it, most exciting tie I've ever been a part of. Yeah. And the no, Matadors the, didn't score until the last 10 minutes. And I just I want to give them a shout-out to the organization for putting on such a good game day atmosphere. Like, even if you don't make it to the tailgate or the after party, which you should go to because those are a lot of fun, they just – the whole staff does a great job with the, the merchandise, the concessions, the game day atmosphere – it's just a lot of fun to be at. Like, I don't know if you went to any minor league baseball growing up, but it's one of those things you can just ignore the game and have a good time. Yes. And, you know, I'm, I'm mostly watching the game, but even if you're not, you know, there's, okay, my wife is getting a snow cone. or I can go get a jersey. I can go out to Jody's car at halftime and drink a Coors Light. I don't know if that's technically Lubbock Matador sanctioned, but. No. So it's been a lot of fun. I, I've seen a, a win, a loss, and a draw, and all three were a blast. And I think that. My only worry about this was that there'd be a lot of hype at the beginning and then it would tail off. To me, the crowd size looked the same as week one. Yes. And it's fun, and so people are going to keep coming back. Yeah. So they announced it as 4,200 on Saturday night. There was a dip on Wednesday, but in Lubbock, it's hard to have events on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. It's a church night. It's a church night. Even in the summer, even in the dead of summer, like, there's just it's Wednesday night. I mean, you can't plan things on Wednesday night. So also there's a little bit of a gap in the schedule that I thought might kill some momentum. But to have 4200 strong in July or June, the end of June, when you hadn't played in Lubbock in three weeks and there was two games in one week, like mm-hmm. you're doing something right. Absolutely. You're absolutely doing something right. And if they do this again. Next year, which I'm assuming they are, I just I don't want to make too many assumptions here, but I I like it at Plains Capital. And if you're gonna keep it at Lowry Field, I don't know there there's anywhere else in Lubbock to do it. Um, but if See, you I, could, if you could grow next year. I was actually discussing this at halftime with a couple folks. Yeah. I almost think a smaller venue would be better. Like I, I guess a venue you have to have where- at least four thousand. Yeah. I mean, could you fit that many at John Walker or at LCU? Not at LCU. And you couldn't do like the tailgate, the beer and all that at LCU. Because I don't know. I feel like it's a it's even though the tailgate's outside. It's too big of a stadium for that. And I know the soccer players don't like the football lines on the field. So I'd like to see them at an actual soccer stadium. And even if the stands are smaller, if you packed in a bunch of people, I think it'd be a really cool atmosphere. Give it. Get it a little, um, create some intrigue, some some demand. Yeah, and, and maybe, you know, for their first year, I'm assuming that a lot of the seats were given away in some form or fashion. Like ours were sponsored as the trade for the podcast. Right. But if you, sell of- eight, if you sell 8,000 tickets or give away 8,000 tickets and 4,200 people show up, if you sell or give away 4,000 tickets, how many people are going to show up? Or just quit giving them away and sell 3,000 and have 3,000 people packed in going nuts together instead of 4,000 spread out in a 20,000 seat. Yeah, but you, yeah, but if 3,000 people buy tickets, you're not going to have 3,000 people show up. Like 25. Well, it's close to it. I mean, whatever. You get what I'm saying. All right. Yeah, there's also a club level and everything else at Plains Capital that you you won't have at, at another place. Um. Yeah, I think I think there's some 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 discussions to be had. Uh, can you can you find a grass facility? Is there a soccer specific facility? I don't know the seating arrangement at John Walker. I don't know the capacity. I Do think I don't know the capacity. I think it'd be full for a Loving Matadors game. And so the thing about John Walker, there's not an opposite section like on the other side of the field, but we don't need one. Yeah if they would let people kind of like line the exterior and make it like a standing room, I think that'd be a super cool environment. 1500. That's it. 
Yeah. I was thinking it was pretty small. Yeah, that might be too small then. Yeah, it's too small. That's why, because they were going to have it there, and then they sold 2,000 season tickets or whatever. Mm. And they were like, uh, well, let's go big, baby. Yeah. I just don't know that there's another place, unless you found another high school stadium in Lubbock, that was a little more intimate. Yeah, I don't know. The if- Cor- there's a Coronado campus has a, a set of stands. Trinity, French Trinity, Cooper Christian. has dedicated soccer fields, or if they just use the football field. Yeah, I don't know either. Mm. Anyway, they're also probably turf, so you can't uh, like mow off the lines in the summer. Another, another sponsor shout out our friends over at Code Ninjas. The owner there, Jody Slaughter, is uh, the aforementioned gentleman who was kind enough to offer me a beer at halftime. He's started to make his way out to some Lubbock Matadors games. Anyway, Code Ninjas teaches kids ages 5 to 14 how to level up their coding, STEM, and engineering skills in a fun, hands-on environment. Not only do they have year-round programs that you can look into, right now they have all kinds of summer camps also going on. They're they're week-long programs, and they use technology that your kids already love, like Legos, Minecraft, and Roblox, to expand their skills, creativity, and confidence. All sorts of things they can learn. As you know, Rob, it's important to keep the kids' minds active during the summer when they're not in school. This is a great environment, a fun place for them to do that. And our listeners can get $10 off any summer camp using the promo code GAUCHOS at checkout. That's good for any of the Lubbock Code Ninjas summer camps. Give them a call at 806-370-0022. Or check out all the programs at CodeNinjas.com. Dot com. Dot com. Make a controller out of a banana. CodeNinjas.com. <laughs> Germ Blast. Sorry. Not a sponsor. What did you think? Do you, of- what, do you have a favorite SNL skit? Oh, a favorite SNL skit. <laughs> this is like off the wall, but. We like to get off the wall. I'm assuming you have one, so you go first and let me think on it for a second. The ESPN classic, uh, like women's bowling (laughs) sketches with Jason Sudeikis as the commentator alongside Will Forte, who is like the idiot who doesn't know anything, but they're wearing mustaches. (laughs) They like just... (laughs) Go off in these wild segues. There's got to be something to that, am I right? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Tampax, helping you relax when Mother Nature attacks your slacks. <laughs> Tampax. All right, let's go back down the floor. All right, uh, the soft one's known for. But they just have like these hard segues that they just are like. Yeah, that's what reminded me of it. The- <laughs> I saw one recently. I can't remember the actor's <laughs> name. He was from one of those like big Netflix shows over the last year or so. Yeah. And it's six or seven guys in a pool hall. And uh, yes, driver's license by Olivia Rodrigo comes on. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of those things like one guy kind of is brave enough to acknowledge that he knows the song. Yeah. And, and then the also- a second guy is like, oh, yeah, no, I've heard this song, too. And the third guy is like, yeah, it's actually pretty good. And like by the end of it, they're all singing along to the entire chorus and everything. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, they're all like grown men, you know, in their 30s or 40s. And, uh, that one was pretty funny. There was an old bit they used to do in a different, different areas, different kind of skits where there would be a song in the background. And then they would say a line and then hit a punchline and then go right back into the chorus and they would all sing the chorus together. <laughs> Those are great sketches obviously bill brasky's some of my favorites too bill brasky i like the um old celebrity jeopardy ones with will ferrell and yeah uh, norm mcdonald playing burt reynolds yes uh turd ferguson sean connery it's funny it's a big hat it's funny (laughs) yeah it's it's not my name (laughs) yeah Yeah, what do you want uh jimmy fallon is james stewart french stewart yeah Yeah, french stewart (laughs) Not a big Jimmy Fallon fan anymore, but he used to be funny. He does a good. He I think jumped the favorite, shark. Yeah, I think my favorite Jimmy Fallon bit is he does a 
medley of 90s and early 2000s troll doll songs yeah that so was that was from his stand-up days before snl or maybe yeah. on his uh maybe that was on his audition tape so he's covering like counting crows dave matthews rem oh. four non-blondes Atlantis more set yeah like I, they're they're, it, it's they're greatest hits up. but it's all about troll dolls <laughs> yeah Oh, I need that's to look at that clip. That's a good I love one. That. I'm going to tweet that out tonight. That's a good one. J- the, the funniest Jimmy Fallon breaking is the the hot tub scene. <laughs> the hot tub scene with Will Ferrell and, um, oh, what's her name? And I think maybe Drew Barrymore and Jimmy Fallon are in there. <laughs> and Jimmy can't keep a straight face. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Anyways. People say the SNL was bad in the 2000s, but Jason Sudeikis and Will Forte and Bill Hader. You want to know my thoughts on that? We're so good. They're old and they don't have good sense of humor anymore. It's one of those things. It's, it's not written just, to them. Yeah. So yeah. people in the, okay, like my grandparents thought yeah. the Beatles were awful and like they hated that my mom and dad and uncles listened to it. Yeah. And then our parents think that whatever crap we listen to in the 90s is awful. And you and I think that whatever is being pumped to 18-year-olds today is awful. Yeah, It's the same with SNL. Like, oh, it's not the same since Chris Farley isn't on there. In 15 years, we'll be like, none of this is as good as when Kate McKinnon and Bowen Yang were on here. It's just like well, an era I'm not going to say that, but Kate McKinnon's great. You don't like Bowen Yang? I didn't. I couldn't have pulled his name out of a hat. I think he's pretty funny. I yeah. I always thought Pete Davidson was overhyped. I don't get it at all. Oh, he's gone now. Yeah, but like I don't understand why he's so famous. I guess because he dates famous people, but I don't know why they date him. I don't think he's that funny. He's yeah. not good looking. I I just don't get it. You sound a little bit jealous of Pete Davidson. No, I'm not. <laughs> Trust me, I don't want to be dating <laughs> Kim Kardashian. But it's like no, one Ariana of those Ariana Grande either. Uh no, no, I mean I'm happily married, but this is right. one of those things like right. I know why Colin Jost is famous because he's funny and he's handsome. Right. Pete, D- Pete Davidson is neither to me and he's more famous, so I don't get it. Uh, and maybe it's not my era. I don't know. He might be more of a Gen Z type thing. Colin Jost also kind of kicked the out kicked his coverage, in my opinion. I mean Scarlett probably, Johansson. Probably anybody married to Scarlett Johansson more or less right. outkicked their coverage to some right. extent. Yeah. Anyways, what did we? What were we talking about? Uh, I think we were talking about Texas Tech sports at some point. Yeah. Do you have any more uh, brave sponsors that go along with us on this wild journey that we need to shout out? No, I think here in the Cardinal Sports Center studio, we already, we already got Rahino, the Lubbock Matadors, Code Ninjas, Diversified Lenders, and Barnett, Howard, and Williams. So I think we've covered our bases there. All right, cool. Do you want to sneak uh, peek at any of the lists or like any hints for this week? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's see if I can guess them. Okay, can you guess tomorrow's, Monday's? Well, I know a few in the pocket. I don't know if you want me to like just get. I thought you said something about a hint. Well, yeah, we could like tease them. I don't want to give them away. Okay. No, just tease them, and then I'll just, in my mind, say, oh, yeah, I know what that one is. Okay. Mondays involves Bill Cosby. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing. A list? Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that he was related to that program. Yeah, he's Baylor Bold, man. Yeah. So this is the uh, comparing... uh, This is the comparing programs to uh, 80 sitcoms is this what we're doing no oh we don't do that no um so th- that one is not really a uh, a ranking it's yeah so th- there's two variations of lists one is like a ranking and the other is each school's best or most you know whatever yeah yeah i got it uh, tuesday is uh, I don't know if there's a hint. It's it's the best football games in Big Twelve history. Oh, nice. So between two Big Twelve programs, current Big Twelve programs, yeah. So is in, is Texas Tech it. and Oklahoma on the list from 2016? It's honorable mention. Okay, that's going to create some some stir. That's not a because people keep telling me that that's Texas Tech's best game lately. That's it's stupid. Not. It was a loss. <laughs> we didn't. It even wasn't a good game that year, did we? 
It wasn't a good game. No. I mean, it's it's notable because of the records that were broken, but it was bad defense. Yeah, no, it's not on the top. Joe 10. Mixon was catching a, a a four yard pass and running for seventy two yards. That wasn't a good game. It wasn't good offense. It was bad defense. Yeah, we had to hear about it forty two times <laughs> in three weeks because Patrick and Baker played. Now that Baker sucks, they don't talk about it anymore, which is hilarious. Sorry, I'm sure it's a great list. Well, and the other thing is. To me, anyway, that was so predictable. Like, okay, yeah, OU wins the game. Right. Baker Mayfield wins the Heisman, whatever. But I've been saying for five years that Pat was going to be the better pro far and yeah. away. Yeah. And Baker Mayfield will be selling insurance by his 30th birthday, and that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. Progressive. <laughs> probably. They need to do a Hulu has live sports commercial with Baker. And make it like an Uncle Rico peaked in high school Rob Lowe kind of bit where it's like, hey, Baker, yeah. remember when you were playing live sports on Hulu? That'd be good. I can't wait for Baker to be on TV like uh, Dan Orlovsky and call all the Big 12 games. <laughs> no. <laughs> Talk about all the batteries that were thrown at him when he came back to Lubbock. <laughs> yeah. How he was okay. stealing signs uh, when he was had to sit out a year. Wednesday's hint is Patrick Mahomes. Okay. Thursday's hint is that it is going to absolutely break Kansas Twitter. And that's okay. Yeah, so you've given the that hint. You gave that hint the Discord, and I still don't know what that one is. I it know it's a Patrick going, Mahomes one. Is. It is going to break. It's not going to break the entire internet, but Kansas Twitter is going to melt down when they see Thursday's list. Is it another thing about Fog Allen? No, it has nothing to do with Fog Allen. Okay. Is it uh, best best Big Twelve teams? No, no, no. You'll just have to wait and see. I can't okay. can't tease it too much. But just right. stay tuned for Thursday. Okay. And then we'll get into the weekend during our midweek episode. Is that fair? Yep, it's fair. Fair is fair. I still want to tweet out Seth Dagey, sixty nine touchdowns. 69% completion percentage, 69 days to kick off. You're the Twitter guy, though. I'm the Twitter I'm guy. I'm not going to step on your bit. Unless we tweet something bad. Even though I keep... Uh, I Well, I was replying to some people hey, because I, I, I couldn't handle it anymore. I've, I've got a bone to pick with you, Rob. Okay. Are you aware that you got trolled into oblivion today on the Gaucho's account? Did I? Yeah, I had to undo it. What happened? The original tweet was like, here are the four best group of five stadiums. And like, it was a call to quote tweet or reply with your favorite. Yeah, and I guy, retweeted. I thought it was a guy funny. From, a guy from Baylor tweeted a picture of the Jones and you retweeted on the Gauchos. I know. I thought it was funny. No, I undid that. That was not funny. I didn't get trolled. You got I knew trolled. it was happening. No. How dare you? I didn't get trolled. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I, think you're I didn't get trolled. I knew what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> I can't laugh. We're a Big Twelve account now. You've made that happen. We're not just a Texas Tech kind of account anymore. College Baseball Nation released their final college baseball rankings, and Texas Tech is not on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, they probably shouldn't be. Fell out of the top twenty-five. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I won't argue with that, honestly. I mean, they're probably in the twenties, um, but you were a three seed, and you lost to a two seed. Even though that two seed went to Omaha, where did Notre Dame finish? Eight, fifth, fifth. Ooh, ooh. Why, why don't you just go to the top ten? Ole Miss, OU, Arkansas, A and M, Notre Dame. Auburn, Texas, Stanford, Tennessee, Oregon State. Tennessee all the way to nine. That's kind of brutal. Well, they didn't make the Omaha. But I wouldn't put them in the top five because they weren't no. in the final four and they lost to number five, Notre Dame. So I would put them yeah. in six maybe. Um, you did have series wins over number seven, Texas, and number 18, Oklahoma State, for whatever that's worth. Two of the teams that kind of contributed to your demise at the end of the year are ranked second and fifth. 
So no shame in that. Right. Certainly. Whatever. Certainly. You could maybe but you're not going to. You're not going to look back in 10 years and be like, hey, man, Tadlock was great with all those national championships, but he didn't land in the top 25 in 2022. Yeah, at least not according to College Baseball Nation, which I yeah. had not heard of until just now. Oh, Nation. Yeah. Yeah, so not even like College Baseball uh, America or whatever. Yeah. Not D1 okay. or College Baseball okay. America. Okay, okay. I thought we were doing some reputable stuff there. Nope. And also, I didn't get trolled. I knew what was happening. No, I, I think you got trolled. I, I think Matt for is, you. I saw who it was. It was Matt as Bear. I, yeah. I knew it was a Baylor guy. Yeah. It was a funny joke. Uh, I fixed it for you. Don't worry. Also, you always know when a certain Oklahoma fan Twitter account is mad when they double text you. And they double tweet you back. back. Yeah, that, that, that happens funny. somewhat frequently. It happened today. You were having a conversation with him, and I jumped in and made him double tweet us. <laughs> yeah. He's a sensitive Sooner, man. I know you're. I know you're a sensitive Red Raider, but he's yeah. a sensitive Sooner. He's yeah. got this complex that, like, I wear it proudly. Everybody who didn't go to OU just walks around twenty four seven thinking about nothing other than how much they hate OU. Yeah, and I'm like, I mean, if we're playing all, yeah. Otherwise, I kind of, whatever. I'm a little bit neutral I, toward OU. Do you know what my feeling toward OU is? They've just been so much better than Texas Tech. I just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no hope in catching them in football. It's just like, okay, let's just get this over with and move on to the next week. <laughs> like, hopefully we win this game. That'd be really cool. It'd be a huge upset. But, like, thank you, sir. May I have another? Let's go beat Texas in Austin. Yeah. Torian Henderson is not walking through that door. No. Seth Dagey. Is not eating peanut butter just sandwiches it, it, during the rain delay, walking through that door, beating number three Oklahoma in Norman. The yeah. only Texas Tech quarterback, by the way, on the air raid quarterback list to win in Norman. The only Texas Tech quarterback to beat Bob Stoops in Norman. But hey, yeah, he doesn't have a big win. Well, and then the next season, he beat a top five West Virginia team by yeah, with Geno points. Smith. Absolutely dogs. He ruined their entire year. He broke them. And he was 40 for 44 against New Mexico, which was just cool. Yeah. I think that's still an NCAA record for highest single game completion percentage over a certain number of attempts, of course. If it isn't, it was broken like last year. Do you want a hot take? I would love one. Set aside supporting cast, set aside win-loss record, set aside NFL career. Yeah, all that. If I lined up all the air raid quarterbacks mm -hmm. and had them toss me a pass, arm like arm talent, I'm going Mahomes. Yeah. After that, as far as like prettiest ball, guy who could spin it the best, Davis Seth Webb. Nagy. No, <laughs> Seth Nagy. <laughs> That's gonna make people mad. I no, it's absolutely right. He could freaking spin it. Just imagine what anyone else would do or what Seth Diggy could do with Cliff as the coordinator or Mike Leach. He had freaking Neil Brown. Mm -hmm. He made Neil Brown look good. He got Neil Brown a head coaching job or he went off to Kentucky maybe first, but people still go back to that. Do you know his little brother went to... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go to Tech. What? <laughs> Grew up a Tech fan. Like in Lubbock? Yeah, I had no Cooper. clue. I had Played no Cooper. idea. Big fan. He wanted to come to Texas Tech. Man, that's Cooped crazy. That's crazy that his older brother played at Texas Tech and he grew up in Lubbock and then went to West Virginia. Oh man, we will. Well, uh, they both played high school football at Tech and then left for a while. They both played high school football at Tech and then left at, for a in while in Lubbock. In Lubbock, sorry. Yeah, Seth played in Lubbock and then they left. And then he came back and played at Cooper for the last year or two. Yeah. Do you know where they were at in between? I don't. I believe they played for the Crane Cranes. Hmm. I believe Jarrett was the Crane Crane quarterback. I know Seth started at Friendship. Yeah, and then, well, finished at Friendship, too. Oh, then maybe he I think he tore his, tore his ACLs. Jarrett, Jarrett Daggy played at Cooper. 
Right. I think Seth Dagey played at both Cooper and Friendship. Oh, did times, he? Is what I'm saying. I think so. I don't remember that. I don't think he ever played at Friendship. I think he tore his ACL in his junior and senior year. I know for a fact Seth Seth Dagey played at Friendship. I think he did played he at Cooper. actually but I could play, though? Yes. Like, I've seen his highlights from oh. Friendship. I thought he tore his ACL too Like, much. I was watching him in the blue and gold with Friendship across his chest playing football. Well, I remember him back then. I was Yeah, I was also in Lubbock. Underrated runner. Remember, he was even if with he had ACL, both his ACLs. Yeah, he could go. Similar to BJ, BJ could move. He didn't want him to. Could he? With a with one ACL, yeah. Okay. I mean, no, he's no Seth Dagey. Cliff couldn't move. No, Cliff got hit so much. Bowman could not move. Harold oh couldn't. God. Harold was not a mover. Harold couldn't move. But he got rid of it. Cliff I remember, just ate the sack. <laughs> <laughs> I remember people thinking that Potts was going to be like dual threat just because he was yeah, he was probably average mobility, but like compared to Harold, they're like, hey, this guy can tuck it and run for a first down, which right. is like a novel concept at the time. You're right. I don't think Cumbie could move either. I think Hodges huh. Hodges could scoot a tiny bit. Hodges was a scooter, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, okay, here, here's your next list, Rob. <laughs> Best running air raid quarterbacks, <laughs> Patrick. Even though he just walked in a bunch of touchdowns, yeah, I think he had 20 rushing touchdowns or something crazy. Honestly, you'd have to put Baker. Baker could move a little bit. Wouldn't have to put anything. I mean, no, you don't. I almost put Baker on the list instead of Davis Webb just as a troll. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only Cliff Kingsbury quarterback with a winning record. Man. <laughs> Tough. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking for half a second, I was like, could I possibly dispute that? No. That's no. He's five and five and two. It's a little bit lopsided just because oh, he got 100 start against like Texas 100%. State, SMU, Stephen SMU, and UTEP, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Webb got like thrown into like at Norman, you know, all that. But anyway. And I think the Big 12 game he started was Texas, and he ha- he's got sacked nine times. <laughs> oh, the game was so bad, I was there. It's horrible. <laughs> oh, my God. They put in Brewer at the very end, and Brewer marches down the field and scored. Yeah. Like, maybe should have done that before the last possession of the fourth quarter. Clip. Right. I think your only touchdown before that Brewer drive was a fake slash impromptu fake punt. And uh, uh, some ink. No, it was Irks Lieben. Erksley, Ryan Erksley. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think it was a called fake. I think he just saw something and just <laughs> realized that every Texas player had his back turned to him, so he just started running and yeah. scored. Erksley. I forgot about him. Fun fact, his dad. He's the greatest his dad's name? Punters in Texas Tech history. Donnie Anderson, Mari Buford. <laughs> uh, the current kid, what's his name? Austin McNamara. Yeah, Erksley. But Erksley's dad, Erksley's dad was a Texas football player. Oh, yeah. I don't remember if he was a punter or something different, but anyway. I once worked at a soup kitchen with Alex Trelika's dad, Gerald. Okay. You had a dad story. I just wanted one, too. <laughs> cool. You know, another dad of a Red Raider. Uh, Patrick Mahomes II. Yep. Future yeah. Hey, uh, big time recruiting news class of 2041. Patrick Mahomes the third, five star quarterback. Yeah. Highest rated quarterback in rivals history since Arch Manning. Might be uh might be a Tim Tadlock put on the board, but we'll see. <laughs> I wonder if Patrick Mahomes the third would have a better ERA than Patrick Mahomes the second. I would assume it would not be difficult to do so. It couldn't be worse. No. Literally Patrick, Patrick Mahomes the second's ERA is infinity. Well, but here's the deal. Tadlock. You think Tadlock makes another 18 years? Mm. He's not he's not he's not old. But he's that's no a long chicken career. Either. That's a long yeah. career. That'd be a, a long place. It'd be a 27 year career at, at Tech. Hey, congratulations to Ole Miss on beating Oklahoma in the College World Series. That guy was there 18 years before he won that national championship. Uh Mike Martin at Florida State, 31 years. Never no won one. True or false? Tim Tadlock is a national championship winning coach at Texas Tech before his 
18th season. I think he's been here 10. This was his 10th. Was this his 9th or 10th? This was his 10th. So in the next eight seasons, Texas Tech wins a national championship. True or false? I will say... See, I'll say true. true man. Okay. I'll say true. I don't know why you wait so long. I was just giving I mean, this a thought. Is that okay? I would just say true, man. Yeah. We're going to win a national championship at Texas Tech baseball. I'll well, say we false. Are. I'll say false Good because... <laughs> Because we're going to win three national championships in the next oh, okay. eight years. Okay. Not one. Well, the premise was, will he be a national championship winning coach? So it could be multiple. That I don't think is how you phrase it. But we can go to the tape. It's a recorded podcast. So All right. I think you said, will he win a national championship? That's what I said first. And then when I was resetting up the question, I messed up. And so I had to say that. So I said okay. both. You're right. Okay. All right. It's I, I've gotten awkwardly dark here in Zoom. Yeah, do you have lights on your apartment or? Yeah, they're not on. No, I could turn okay. it on. Well, I think we've talked long enough, especially for an off-season episode. Yeah, I was about to say final thoughts is where I was going with that. Final oh, thoughts. Gross. Keep an eye out for the countdown to kickoff and more Big 12 lists. I'm ready. All right. Love y'all.